Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. So Abdul Shakur joins me for part two and for those who didn't watch part one, I'm gonna include it on the screen somewhere and we are here again to talk about how to raise private investment. Uh, Abdul, welcome back, my friend. It's good to have you here. Yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. I think um, even after the cameras stopped rolling in the last session, we got into quite a, a good conversation and I think we thought, you know, we've got to be a part two to this. So I appreciate you bringing me back. Absolutely. Part two, potentially part three. We'll, we'll see where this goes because there is a lot of value that we can uh, we can share. And raising investment is obviously something very big at the moment in the in the finance and investment industry. So, for those that are watching, and thank you if you are, we are going to dive into things a little bit more um, in terms of detail and how you can actually structure your social media platforms in order to raise investment. And we're going to kick things off with LinkedIn and the power that LinkedIn has to connect with business owners and investors alike. So we're going to start with Abdul. Um, I'll throw this one at you first. How, you know, how can we utilize to start with the keyword search on LinkedIn to find our perfect investor client? Again, one of the things I've realized with the search term is that you've got so many different sort of filters that you can utilize. And I think most people don't know what filters are out there. So for example, I try and filter down from one filter is profession. So I'll, I'll keyword search to profession. Then I'll filter down to location because I want to meet more people local to me or in the major capital city like London, for example, if I'm traveling from Midlands, I will then uh, even sort of niche down into sort of the, um, in terms of like, you know, what industry they're from. So are in the financial industry, are they in real estate, are they in medical, you know, what sort of industries are they working in? And then even more so, I will try and connect as many of these guys as I can. So before I send any messages out, before I even do anything, what I will do is I'll spend half an hour to an hour you know, going down the list and connecting with as many people as I can. I tend to start off with second degree connections first, purely because one, it's a lot easier to connect with them, but two, they feel like, okay, I'm more likely to accept your request because there's a mutual connection. So as you build that, you're, it becomes a lot more easier for you to connect to more and more people. So I spend probably, I probably connect to probably about 100 people a week. And then that allows me to then create a little funnel for me to then message them directly. So that's what I will do. Yeah, awesome. And I would second that and a little tip what I would do in order to kind of identify and use the keyword search is if you're thinking to yourself, okay, I want to find an investor for my project, for my business, but how do I know who I'm searching for? Again, we mentioned it on part one is that you can use the power of polls because you can essentially put out a poll, um, you know, in terms of maybe what your business relates to, who you're looking for, put obviously the four options and have an option that is closest to who you are looking for. And then as long as your poll can get the right exposure and the right reach, and let's say you get 10, 15 people clicking uh, option A, which is the one that identifies your potential client or investor, then what you can do is you then you can do a bit of research around who is, who is looking for that type of return. And you're gonna see obviously the careers that they're in, doctors, you know, dentists, health and safety executives, um, and directors of companies. So that's a good way to identify. And then from there, obviously, you can apply that into the keyword search. So when we dive in on the keyword search and we start connecting, what's the next process for you, Abdul? Because I have my own process, but of course, there's that, there's, there's that too early of a connection and then the message. So do you connect and then leave it a little while until you send that message? I would. So what I would try and do, I spend time trying to engage with them on their profile. So for example, rather than trying to send them a message there and then, it comes across spammy because you want something straight away and that's the reason why you connected. What I will do is I will compliment them. I will try and endorse them on their profile. I will go down to see their recent posts or their recent engagements. I'll come in and even the things that they've commented on other people's profiles, I will get engaged in that conversation just so they see me come up in their timeline and I think in their notifications. So when I do message them, it's not like a cold message. They've seen that I'm a friendly person. They've seen that, you know, I'm I'm adding value or I'm complimenting them, they're more likely to, to look at my profile and it gives them time to, you know, go down my profile before messaging them. 
Yeah, so that's a top tip there. I would really, really second what Abdul just said. And another thing that you can do as well is, I suppose this is off the back of what you've just said, is you know, hop onto their website, use their profile as leverage to find out a little bit more about them. And when you send a potential investor a message, keep it short, sweet, but refer to something in their profile. You know, I'd say, hi Abdul, um, great to connect. I happened to hop onto your profile. I saw that you're involved in such and such. Took a, took a look at your website and it mentions that you are involved in this. Um, be great to know more. Would it be okay to ask a couple of questions? All the best, Aaron. So something like short, sweet, but like you said, make it personal rather than the generic sales pitch. And you know what? This is a thing that I've utilized LinkedIn a lot more so for it more recently. It's connecting with strategic partners. Now, you can reach out to investors and build a direct investor. And so that's brilliant, right? But I started to connect with more people who can introduce me to investors. These are tax partners that are accounting firms. These are lawyers. These are other you know, people who work in recruitment that have large, you know, that recruit senior executives. I try and build relationships with more strategic partners. And I have a separate strategy for that and not just message directly people to investors. I find that if there's a crossover, and there's a partnership to be built, it's a lot more easier to do it that way rather than having to um, you know, direct message a lot of people and try and get a response from them. The other thing it does is when you connect with strategic partners, every time they like your post, it automatically goes out into their feed and it, and it goes out to their connections. So if you were to connect with their connections, it makes it easier for you to then send a message because they know a mutual connection already. Yeah, nail on the head, um, referrals, so introductions. So let's touch on that. The power of introductions and referrals is huge. So that's how I've had a lot of my investors, that's how a lot of my network still builds to this day is through the power of uh, introductions. I actually mentioned that was one of the top tips in my book actually, how and uh, where to find high net worth investors is using uh, individuals and companies such as accountants, tax advisors, because of course, they're working on behalf of many wealthy people. So Abdul, you know, that's totally correct in the sense that try and build relationships with key individuals who may work um, and may be introducing you to some of these wealthy high net worth investors. So that's a top tip. Note that down, everyone. So when we're posting on LinkedIn, social media, whatever platform people are using, something that I always see that goes amiss, and again, really note this down, this is something you're gonna to need to start doing if you're not already, is having some form of a disclaimer when you're posting for investment. Whether that just be a little capital at risk, only suitable for high net worth investors, whatever it might be, but disclaimers are quite important, aren't they? Absolutely, like, you know, I was flicking through the FCA handbook just yesterday, which I sent to some of my clients that I was working with, and, and again, Every one, they do have to mention those things, but even their marketing, they're not allowed to mention percentages. They're not allowed to mention certain aspects of things. So you have to be careful in how you promote. Now, the SDA handbook actually is really helpful because what it does, it gives you ideas as to what you can and can't say, even to the point where they give you examples of what type of content other people or other investment firms that are regulated have created. So it's a really useful tool um, that I would go and check out. Uh, I'm more than happy to, to share that with people afterwards as well. Yeah, no, that, that, and it's a great shout because it's almost like a guidebook. So if you're not sure on something, you can literally hop on to the FCAs, even the website and go through and it. There's been a lot of changes actually, hasn't there in the last year, some regulation changes. So if you're not familiar and you are looking for investment and you're promoting that and marketing it, you do have to be careful what you put. But disclaimers are there for a reason. They will just protect you if needed. So that's really important. Messages, when it comes to sending DMs or sending that message, if I'm connecting with someone on LinkedIn, I'll typically leave it maybe two days before I message because then it shows a bit of distance between that connection. And I can also refer to when I connected with them. So for example, I'm gonna use Abdul as an example. I would say, hi Abdul, I made a note to connect with you. Um, I think we connected a couple of days ago, made a note to reach out to you. Just wanted to, uh, just wanted to ask if we could perhaps collaborate or have a discussion about 
X, X, Y, and Z, whatever it might be, but I like to leave it a couple of days. Is that something similar that you would do, or how do you do it? Sometimes I leave it a week, uh, purely because I like to do it in batches, um, and it's a great way to start my day or start my week. So, for example, if I spend one week connecting with people, I'll wait till the next week to, to then connect with people because it gives you that time and distance, but purely I can spend more time engaging with them on their profiles and their content. So I'll, do, I'll probably wait till a little bit longer, um, and then I'll be like, oh, sorry, I have no, uh, I totally forgot to connect with you. I know we just connected. You know, how's life treating you? And and I'll start our conversation from that point of view. It's quite basic, really, isn't it? You just said it there. I like that. Is that a conversation? Nothing forced, and it literally is to start a relationship. You have a conversation. You know, just like having a coffee with someone. You know, if you're a bit nervous, the other thing that I would say is voice notes are fantastic because. When someone opens up a message, they instantly you think, oh, another generic message. Or, you know, even if it's a little bit more tailored, you're still, you're still undecisive whether you read it fully and get back to them. Whereas if you hear a voice note, it almost makes you keen to hear what that person's got to say. And I find that there's more of a connection when you hear someone's voice and it makes you want to get back to them more. So is that something also that you would that you would do? Absolutely. Like I started the trend probably a couple of years ago of sending video messages. Um, that was a very, I did it across all social media platforms, not just LinkedIn, purely because they're like, oh, wow, you've said, you, you've said their name. So and you know it's personalized and directed to them. And when they hear your when they hear their name, they're like, oh, this person's taking that time to send me an actual message. And then you can, you know, pinpoint something on their profile. It's just a lot more powerful. People like in a world where you know messaging and inst- and, and sort of interactions are so quick and, and you know everything is just a touch of a finger, personalization has been missed out. Like the more personalized your approach is, the more, the more likely you are to get an interaction. Okay, cool. I, I want to summarize us covering off LinkedIn here. So for those that are watching, we really go over the point. So it was all about using the keyword search. That's really key is, you know, using techniques as putting out polls, identifying who could be your potential investor, and then using that on the keyword search. It then came down to obviously putting out those posts with disclaimers, template messages, reaching out sort of anywhere from 48 hours to a week later, and um, and really building a relationship through conversation. So LinkedIn has so much potential, everyone. It's, it's full of CEOs, directors, you know, family offices, funds, institutions, all these big people. So before we move on, Abdul, any final words on those looking to utilize LinkedIn? Absolutely. So what I, I'll give you guys my messaging script. Um, and this is a messaging script that I, I give to my clients and it's something that's extremely like effective in terms of how it works. So what I will say is, hi, I hope you and your family are well during the pandemic because it is something that's a common question everyone's talking about. And then I will say, I noticed on your profile that you're doing so and so. So for example, I'll find something tailored to talk about in profile. Now, rather than going into a sales pitch or rather than going into, this is what we do, this is what we offer, I'll ask you a simple question because a question prompts a response. So I'll just say something like, out of curiosity, have you thought about hands-off investments? Let me know. In the meantime, have an amazing day. That's all I will say. And what that does is like, it, it gives them time to think about like what sort of, you know, have they thought about this? If it hasn't come across their mind, they'll be like, no, I haven't really thought about it, but it's something I, I think I should look into. Or, yeah, I've been looking into it recently, but I don't really know what's out there. Like in the world of investments, a lot of people, I think I'd say probably 90% or even more people, don't really know what's available to them. So you've got to prompt that discussion. So if you're the first person to say, you know, if you've thought about it, you know, why have you not already made that move? And a lot of people are in that position. So I will try and get a response. And then I will say, why don't we catch? And then from there, I will go on to like, if they respond and they'll say, uh, yes, I've thought about it, but I haven't really got around to it. And I'll say, brilliant. Why don't we catch up over a video call? And I'll book that appointment in there and then. It's so vital that you utilize social media to take the conversation offline as quick as you possibly can, but get that appointment in the diary. Don't just send brochures and things across. Get that appointment in the diary and then send them a brochure just before the call. Yeah, lock it in. Totally agree. And what what my final point would be is routine as well. So a structure for your posting because it's so easy to give up if you're not getting the right engagement. And I would say even if you went down to the basics of a Monday, Wednesday and Friday, once in the morning and one in the fri- uh, one in the evening. And I would say just on the poll system, what do we all do when we wake up? 
we look at our phones, most of us, we check our social media. So I would always say put out a poll in the morning because everyone is so quick and, and they just want something instant that they're likely to click a poll opposed to reading a long post which they might do settling down in the evening. So those are my final points. Um, okay, well let's move on to Instagram. How can we utilize Instagram? It's a very uh, visualization, it's, it's very kind of, um, you know, you put out what you can do and try and draw people in. How can we use stories and interaction buttons to perhaps identify people? I think the biggest mistake that people make with Instagram is that they just show the lifestyle and other things. And while that's important, that's brilliant, I think Instagram for me is a place for you to show you're more human. Like that for me is, is one of the reasons why I'm on Instagram. I'll show different sides of my personality, the charity work that I'm doing. That's a visual thing. And, um, you know, the you know, in terms of like the podcast that I'm on, I will do that. Like anything that I can do to, even like food, if I'm eating at a restaurant, I'll do a food review, I'll talk about things. It's to document my day-to-day -day life so people get an insight into who I am as an individual. So it allows me to then connect with people that actually I think are going to be great for investment. The second thing that I've done more recently, I've done carousel, and I think you've done this as well quite more recently, I've seen, um, where I'll do a carousel. But when I do a carousel, rather than talking about what we offer and how we do it, I'll talk about why we're doing it. And, and there's a huge difference in, in, in terms of when it comes to marketing on social media is people talk about what they do, the benefits, the features. Now talk about why you're doing this. That why is an emotional connection. So people are more likely to resonate with you as an individual if there's a why associated with it. So I did a post on Instagram and I spent, I even boosted it on ads. So I did a carousel, why I started an investment company. And I, I boosted it after a while. And then I think I got tons of inquiries through my social media, through my website. Uh, I probably picked up probably close to at least 30 to 40 leads in the space of a month. Yeah. It's that I would really strongly recommend everyone remembers what Abdul just said is creating a why you're doing it rather than a look at me, look what I'm doing, all about me, you know, that kind of vanity that can sometimes come off the back of Instagram. So it has to be a why, what value are you providing? Um, and then allowing some form of an interaction where people can get in touch. And to give that case study that, that we spoke about just off camera is I had an individual follow me for ages, watch my stories, never reached out, and eventually reached out and said, I'd love to meet when you're in London, sat down, had a conversation over a coffee um, in Mayfair, had a chat, and there was two million sitting in a bank account doing nothing. And you just think, wow, you know, you don't often find this on Instagram, but they are out there, which kind of leads me on to my next point is the power of and we briefly touched about uh, touched on this in uh, part one in, in the other video, and I'll, I'll pop up a link to that on the screen somewhere, you can go check that out, is that we can do background checks using Companies House, which can really give us a lot of data about the individual that we're speaking with. So if you know someone's a director, go check them out on Companies House. I mean, you know, do you do that, Abdul? Absolutely. I, I will always look at, okay, have they, uh, have they put recent accounts up? How long have they been operating? How many business partners they have? If they have any other appointments, for example, you can go on to the, you know, if they're a director, I say on company, click on their name, and you can see all the director of the other businesses that they're involved in. That will give you a better indication of how much revenue that company is generating. Um, you can you know, ask for more detailed reports. I think there's a lot of softwares. There's even another software where you can do credit checks on companies as well. Um, I've started to use that software more so just to get a better indication of, you know, what exactly are they buying? What are they selling? How much profit they're generating? Do they have any debt on their company? Uh, and things like that, that give me more of an insight. So when I do research, uh, I know where to tread and how to tread. Yeah, Companies House is absolutely golden. I mean, that you just touched on it there. And this is something that, you know, how many people are doing this, you know, in order to get great results, you've got to be doing things people aren't doing and things such as, you know, even if you've got a whiteboard like the one behind me, and a friend of mine says, why is your whiteboard always empty? <laughs> you know, it always is. But what you can do is you can tree things off, like you say, if I'm targeting Abdul and I'm thinking, okay, he's he's the man for me, he's an investor that I need to contact with, you know, what appointments does Abdul have? What other directors are on the um, on the board? Can I connect with them on LinkedIn? And you find that almost like there's this endless, exciting tree that you can go down and then they own, you get a good idea, you know, if someone own, owns 
uh, you know, whatever it might be, a haulage company. But then off that haulage company, they have a property investment buying company. They have a they have a real estate land ownership company. And before you know it, you're like, this is a client for me. It's, it's interesting you say that. Like every business owner that I've met that's in the high net worth category does have multiple businesses. They started off somewhere. They built that. They either sold that or moved on, or they kept that business one, but they ventured off to spin offs. Every successful entrepreneur will do that at some point in time. So it's very important to to look back at what they've previously done as well, because it'll give you an indication of, oh, why they exited the business? Did this business fail? Did this business succeed or did it sell? Yeah. So what can we summarize on here then, Abdul, do you think? I mean, we're looking at why. So the reason why you're doing what you're doing to give that, you know, if someone's watching you from afar on Instagram or social, whatever social media, so they want to understand why you're doing what you're doing. What is it that is being put on offer? Because do you think that's something else that we need to do a little bit more is we can talk about the why, we can talk about what we're doing, but we also need to at some point go, okay, this is what I'm doing, my good people. I'm also after this in return. Absolutely. And I think this is where your bio comes in. It's, you know, it needs to be super clear. Um, everyone's bio is geared towards, I've seen you a lot, they're, they're geared towards giving, you want your comments from return, so you have to do it in a subtle way. So what I've done is I'll put CEO of an investment firm, so it means that people can come to me and approach me. I'll talk about the, how much money that I've raised or how much I've developed or you know the successes that I've had, and then I'll just have a call to action and I'll say something like, appreciate your wealth, and then I'll put an arrow down to a link towards my website. What that will do is naturally when people first click on your profile, they want to know, they want to they want to know like how you know how you can help them what you're doing in the business and you know if they'll click on your profile and they've got a link there that they can click on they will go straight to your website yeah create that and do you think aesthetically it needs to look you know professional because this is something else that i see as well is if your profile is you know you have your picture try and keep it nice and professional or at least opening so someone looks at you and think oh, i can have a chat with that guy or girl and then have that i, I like to have mine in s small writing going down into bigger so it looks aesthetically pleasing rather than having a long line short line long line short line and it looks a bit messy you almost want the eye to go down to the click yeah, absolutely. There's so much you can do. I, I, I just, just as long as it's professional and you've utilized the right language. Don't use language that's just known to the property industry. Utilize generic language. So, for example, anyone like if you can, like they say, marketing. If you can explain it to a 12 year old, you're more likely doing well. So, you know, just make sure your messaging is simple and clear. Um, you know, you can make it aesthetic and you'll change that and you'll find a thing that works for you. But it just needs to be straightforward. Yeah. And as we come to a close, I think we've covered off quite a bit more detail there in what we can actually do actively in order to start connecting with the right people. If we bring it back to face to face networking, you know, there's that saying, and I, I do believe this because it has worked for me, is that, you know, try and follow the money because essentially if you can be in the rooms with the money and for me that's very much london is there any particular networking events where you think okay that's going to be holding quite a bit of money i need to be in that room i know we covered it a little bit in part one but let's just go over it again i've i've gone recently i've been going to a lot more award ceremonies um, and there's industry award ceremonies and there's business award ceremonies i go to a lot of them because one you need to be earning a certain amount to afford a ticket at these events, firstly. So, for example, companies that will buy a table, they're spending a couple of grand on a, on a table, and then they'll buy drinks and everything for their staff. Uh, that's the first thing. And second thing, I look at the sponsors. So, for example, who's sponsoring that category or who's sponsoring those companies? Is the director or CEO, who most likely will be there on the day, can I go over and introduce myself? Even yeah. can I get a picture with them? Because that picture will then allow me a follow up conversation later on. And it, it just like, and then I go to these events because sometimes I've met people over the years I haven't met more recently. So I'll go to these awards I mean, to reconnect with individuals, especially now that we've had COVID go on and, and people haven't really seen each other and we don't really know what the people are up to. You know, I will go to these awards I mean, just to just to, you know, catch up with people that I haven't spoken to in years. Yeah, so I reckon we can finish on three top tips from each of us on how 
we could successfully connect with the right investors. And Abdul, what I'll do is I'll go first, and these are my three top tips really out of everything that we've talked about, is I would say one, the voice notes are key, and, and I'm actually gonna touch on this very briefly, is that I had a reply from a key individual uh, today who's gonna be joining me on the podcast, and that came by way of a voice note. And the, the chap who got back to me is gonna be um, incredible to my network and introducing me further um, onto his network. So that's that's key for me. Um, routine and showing up, you know, being consistent, especially on LinkedIn. And thirdly, um, again, like you said, is, is showing who you are, the why and the reasoning behind it. What would you say your three would be? Uh, my first one is personalization. In a world where it so much is going on and everyone's spamming each other, I think the more personalized you are, the better it'll be. Number two is uh, be human. I, I, again, it, it's all about your values, and a lot of people don't get across their values enough. And thirdly, I think it's consistency. I think you've got to make this a priority in your business. You've got to be consistent day in, day out. And if you're not being consistent, that's probably, reason, that's probably the reason why you're not going to get the results that you want. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think we've provided a lot of value again. I don't think there's many videos out there diving into the detail like we are. So, you know, if this really does help people and we keep putting them out, um, you know, we can do part three. We can, we can catch up perhaps every now and again, Abdul, and just dive into things that maybe people request. So, Abdul, again, um, if people want to reach out to you, I know many people are following you already, but where can they go, my friend? Uh, they can go to abdushukur.com, which has details of, of what I've done and some testimonials and things like that. They can follow me on Instagram. I'm, I'm going. I'm trying to dive more into, de into detail in Instagram right now. So they can follow me at abdushukur LDN. I stand for London. Um, and yeah, any other social media platform that, that they're on at the minute. Awesome. Well, everyone who has watched this far, thanks so much for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you soon in a part three.